Today we're going to um, visit some of the very famous stories of the Torah. And, and I would imagine that, that you, like I, like scratch our heads. Come on, Adam. Come on, Eve. You created by Hashem. There's no, no excuses. And you couldn't withstand the temptation. You had to mess it up, you know, within your, the first hour of your existence. And in fact, the Medrash tells us that um, had God, uh, excuse me, had they not eaten from the tree of knowledge, three hours later, God would have gave, served them a Shabbat dinner from the tree of knowledge. So what's so terrible about, so he couldn't let them eat it beforehand? Um, and they couldn't hold themselves in for three hours? So of course, there's a lot of understanding and um, commentary that God wanted to give them the knowledge, but on his terms, so that we should be able to use the knowledge appropriately, not on our terms. And they couldn't, they didn't cooperate, so to speak. And so you have the story of the serpent coming to Eve and trying to convince her back and forth, and she sees how wonderful it is, and then you like scratch your head, what is, what's so terrible about this tree? It's, it's about knowledge of good and evil. What should be, what's so terrible about knowledge and good of, of good and evil? And, you know, it goes, it, it, it boils down to a business plan. You know, every successful business has to have a business plan. And God has a business plan for the world. And the Torah is God's business plan, right? But every business plan or every businessman, um, as organized and as thought through as they are, um, and you know, businesses put a lot of effort that there should be no surprises and no crises and uh, no disasters and nothing unexpected. Everything is prepared for. Everything is um, expected. But deep down, the owner of the business knows that it's the unexpected that really contains the potential for the greatest growth. It is the the crises that if you manage them uh, smartly, appropriately, um, give us, uh, open up reservoirs of, of, of gain and profit beyond any, any of the imagination. And so God had a business plan for the world. The business plan was everybody should do the right thing. The Torah tells us the do's and the don'ts, guides us. And uh, according to the business plan, God um, imbued us with a temptation to, to sin. What, is it, what, is this, what does sin mean? Sin doesn't only mean violating some technical rule. Sin means putting yourself front and center at the expense of others. That's sin. When it's not about what's right, when it's not about Hashem, when it's not about the other, it's about you, there's a lot of mistakes that are going to be made if that becomes your criteria. And so... Chava, before she ate from the tree of knowledge, did not have, according to the um, Kabbalistic understanding, did not have a, a visceral, immediate, personal experience with that self-centered pleasure center that we all have today. When she ate from the tree of knowledge, that's what entered her. What does it mean, yoide toivara, knowing? We know that when the Torah uses the word knowing, it's not just knowledge, it's experience. 
it's a visceral experience. It's, it's a personal, uh, front, it's upfront and personal, so to speak. So when she ate from the tree of knowledge, she started feeling her own agendas, her own self-centered uh, priorities. And one can say that we are feeling the effects to this very day. Because since the sin of the tree of knowledge, when good and bad, what is good and bad, God-centered, self-centered becomes very much mixed. And it's very hard to have an act that is totally God-centered without any sense of self. Because that's just what the human condition is all about. And so um, Hashem, God, wanted us to have that struggle. And that's part of the business plan. Because when you have the struggle between self and other, and you choose other, it elevates that choice and it makes it meaningful. It makes it very powerful. But the plan is that you should always be able to withstand temptation and not act from a self-centered spot. But that's not always what happens. And now I'm really going to confuse you. That is also, on some level, the subconscious plot that God few, instills or writes into the code of, of our world. And so the business plan doesn't call for that failure, but it happens. And when it happens, it becomes purposeful. It becomes meaningful because it happened. And then it becomes the stepping stone for incredible blessing if you exercise your freedom of choice in the right way. So what I'm going to hopefully achieve today is you're going to walk out with a sense of how human beings and God partner and in, in essence are synthesized that every aspect of life is part freedom of choice and part determinism. Part freedom of choice, part fate. So Chava ate from the tree of knowledge. The Gemara, the, there's a, a verse in Tillam that God plots and causes, in a sense, man to sin. Now, that's a very wild statement. What do you mean God causes man to sin? We, we have to take responsibility for it. And it's, it's a hybrid. We have to take responsibility for our actions. We, Chava had to take responsibility for her actions. But God set it up so that there would be a possibility for her to stumble and fall. And as a result, open up an entire vista of growth through challenge that has become part of our human experience from the beginning of time, from Chava's time. And so move on to the next uh, major world uh, event of sin. What's that? The golden calf, Cain and Abel, was a personal one. The golden calf was a collective one. And just take a look. I'm going to share with you the, um, the basic story with Rashi's interpretation. And you're going to start scratching your head again. First of all, we wonder how in the world could the Jewish people have failed so profoundly 40 days after they received the Torah? So some say that because they received the Torah, but it was all like, uh, you know, it was shock and awe, 
It was like a fireworks display. As soon as the display is gone, then it's dark. So God appeared to them. It was all exciting. The curtain comes down, and now it, it didn't have a chance to get assimilated to the point where they could withstand the temptation of idolatry, whatever that temptation is. It's hard for us to imagine that. But beyond that, let me, allow me to, to, to read for you. Um, the story of the, of the golden calf, because that is the most central story of sin and, and uh, reconciliation. Vayar ha'am ki voshesh Moshe laredet minahar. And the people saw that Moses was delayed in coming down from the mountain. Okay, he's delayed. What's the delay? Why was he delayed? Well, Rashi explains that Moses said he's coming back in 40 days. He meant 40, 24 hour days. And they counted the day that he went up as the first day when it should not have been the first day. It should have been zero. And the night should have started the first day. So now comes the 40th day, he's not there, and all of a sudden they can't wait. So the fact that they can't wait for a half a day, that's a little interesting. Did they have to go create some substitute for Moshe like right away? So that's the first thing that's interesting. Um, and they gather uh, around Aaron. And they say to Aaron, come make for us somebody or something that will go and lead us. And Rashi brings the Medrash that, that the Satan came and created uh, a darkness and a sense of a, a weather disturbance. So they began to sense that there's something wrong here. Something spiritually is going on. And then they saw amidst the clouds an apparition, a vision of Moses ascending on high. And they said, okay, Moses is gone. So why did God allow the Satan to create that diversion? I mean, after all, he's not here. There's some kind of spiritual vision about Moses going out into the uh, wild blue yonder. And that's not enough. Aaron tries with all his might to delay them, to um, divert their attention. What is he saying? He says, um, okay, let's do this because he didn't want to stand against them. They would have probably killed him. He said, go grab the uh, jewelry from your wives. And he was thinking like, you know, it's gonna be a little, take a little time to negotiate <laughs> taking the jewelry from your wives' ears and, and that's it, it will, we'll delay a little bit. Because no matter what, no matter how, how uh, uh, strong he tried, how, how hard he tried to convince them that Moses was coming in a few hours, it, did, it wasn't working. He says he has to delay them. So what happened? According to one opinion, they didn't ask their wives. They just pulled it off and came and ran. Another opinion says they brought their own jewelry. They didn't even go to their wives. And, then Mo, and Aaron says, okay, uh, let's uh, take this jewelry and get rid of it. So he throws it into the fire. And out comes a calf. So like, and, and according to the tradition, you're, you're, it's the first time you're hearing that, right? Out comes a calf. How did that happen? Well, there was, uh, when Moses was looking for uh, Joseph's casket, it was buried in the Nile. It was sunken in the Nile. So he wrote on a piece of paper, Alay Shur, come up ox, because the ox is a symbol of Joseph. Somehow this paper got into the wrong hands. They threw the paper into the fire, Alay Shur, and an ox came out. So God, if you, if you really didn't want the Jewish people to sin at the golden calf, why did you make it so easy? It seems as if you were all helping it along. And that doesn't make any sense. Idolatry is forbidden. Why would you help this along? And this goes to a deep understanding of how God works in the world. Naira alila al bene adam means in, in English, God sometimes um, works his ways uh, through human action. Now, the Jewish people sin at the golden calf. And God gets very upset. He wants to destroy the Jewish people. 
And Moshe Rabbeinu steps up as the marriage counselor, and he, he calms things down. And actually, let's step back for a moment, because that's the metaphor. The Jewish people and, and Hashem married on Mount Sinai. The Torah was the ketubah. And they had a 40-day honeymoon. Then the first argument starts. Yeah, the first, the first uh, disagreement. And God says, I'm done with this relationship. This doesn't work. I've had it. And Moshe comes in as the marriage counselor. And he, uh, he starts talking to God. I mean, hey, listen, you're going to destroy the Jewish people. This is the Jewish people that you uh, brought out of Egypt. What are the nations of the world going to say? What about your promise to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? And Hashem says, don't worry about my promise. You're going to be the next Jewish people. They'll come from you. And Moshe says, oh, no. <laughs> Who's to say you're not going to get mad at me or my children? And, and in fact, um, according to tradition, God never planned to destroy the Jewish people. It was all a setup for Moshe to exercise his freedom of choice, to advocate on behalf of the Jewish people. That's what God wanted. And when God said, Hanicholi, leave me be, and I'm going to destroy the Jewish people, Moshe says, ah, he's saying, leave me be, uh-uh. That means if I don't leave him be, he can't destroy the Jewish people. I'm not going to leave him be. Like it's like uh, telling your kid, leave me alone. I'm busy now. I'm on the phone. Yeah, right. The kid, right? Your child only just starts nudging you even harder. Every time you tell your kid, leave me alone, does it help? So Hashem told his kid to leave him alone. And he did, and he did whatever all, every kid does. He grabs on tighter. And he advocated for the Jewish people. And he created a, a infrastructure, a dynamic, that never again will the existence of the Jewish people be at risk. This was the power and the beauty of this event. In fact, some say that this event was more significant than the giving of the Torah, than the going out of Egypt. It was the serving of the, of the golden calf. Because the serving of the golden calf gave an opportunity for this relationship to be tested for the first time. Is it going to survive its first challenge of disloyalty? And once we survive the golden calf, never again will the Jewish people ever be threatened by a severance of the relationship ever again. So tell that to the um, replacement theologists of the world, that the Jewish people are no longer the chosen people. So where, where, where does that come from? And so the golden calf gifted the Jewish people with a security in their relationship. Yes, we might sin and we might be exiled and we may, be, may suffer as we have so much, but never to the extent that we're going to be completely cut off, ever. That was the beauty. The, the golden calf, the Gemara says in Avodah Zarah that the Jewish people were not, um, were not worthy of, not worthy is the wrong word, were not um, uh, so really susceptible to that kind of behavior. But it was somehow orchestrated in order to demonstrate for the world the immutability, the eternity of, of our relationship with Hashem. And I'd like to parenthetically just... Um, share with you a little side story. So Moshe Rabbeinu um, breaks the tablets, right? And then he goes up on the mountain for another 40 days. And by the way, does people, do you all know that it was three times 40? Not two, not one. Three times 40 days. 120 days. 
The third 120 days was Rosh Chodesh Elul, and Moses came down with the second tablets on Yom Kippur. That's why Yom Kippur is Yom Kippur, because that was the day that Hashem forgave the Jewish people. And it says that Moshe Rabbeinu's face was radiant when he came down off the mountain with the second tablets. They couldn't even look at him, right? They couldn't look at him. He had to put a mask on. So what is that? So the commentaries ask, why was his face not radiant when he came down with the first set of tablets? He was up with Hashem for 40 days studying with God. It's enough to bring radiance. And the answer is, he earned the radiance through his advocacy of the Jewish people. In other words, he, he advocated for sinners and he earned his radiance. He, became, he glowed to the point where they couldn't even stand in his presence. He was so holy. Not because he gave the Torah to the Jewish people, not because he stood with Hashem and was God's student, but because he advocated for those who others may have thought didn't even deserve to be advocated for. That's Moshe's radiance. And uh, a parenthesis on top of a parenthesis, I have to share this incredible little vignette with you. You know that the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, had a very special relationship with um, Rabbi Soloveitchik from Yeshiva University, one of the greatest scholars of our time. They, lit, they studied together in the University of Berlin. And they were in the same class. And they went to a particular Rav, uh, I forgot his name, to study Torah and discuss in Torah dur you know, during, during their stay there. And throughout, uh, after they came to America, the Rebbe became the, the leader of Lubavitch, and he became the leader of the modern Orthodox uh, movement, and uh, they kept up. So in 1980, um, I was 20 years old, and I was at the 30th anniversary of the Rebbe's leadership in February of 1980, and Rabbi Soloveitchik came to the Fabrengen. He came to honor the Rebbe. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen pictures of a Fabrengen. There's like thousands, 10,000. At that Fabrengen, there was like 10,000 people in the room, packed. And I remember, and personally, actually, my, my cousin was a very close student of his, and he came along with him. So when he came in, the Rebbe stood up and went over to greet him. And the entire crowd stood up. The honor that he received that night. He was gonna stay for a half an hour, and he stayed for three. And actually, you can even see a video, if you look it up, Rebbe and Rabbi Sullivan, you can see a video of the Rebbe standing up to, to welcome him, and then when he left, the Rebbe stood up to say goodbye to him. So the next day, uh, one of the Chabad leaders went to his office to see how it, you know, his impressions. So he quoted, amongst other things, he quoted um, this uh, piece of, of this homish, this pasuk, that Moshe's face was radiant. And he asked the same question, why was Moshe's face radiant now and not before? So he said, in his own words, he said, before, for the first tablets, Moshe, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was a Rosh Hashiva. What is a Rosh Hashiva? Uh, head of a, a, an academy. He was an educator. He was the head of a Talmudic academy. After the second tablets, he was a Rebbe. Not a Rosh Hashiva, a Rebbe. What's the definition of a Rebbe? Someone who cares deeply about Klai Yisrael. So he said, I knew the Rebbe in Berlin. There, I was impressed with his incredible knowledge, his genius, his memory. There, I knew him as a Rosh Hashiva. Last night, I saw him as a Rebbe, and his face radiated like a Rebbe. And that is the golden calf. That's what the golden calf was all about. And so, 
if we move forward in time to Moshe Rabbeinu hitting the rock and so unfair, he's about to retire and they pull his pension away at the last minute. Right? He put in 40 years and now they fire him. I said, what is this? So he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Mela, I can think of worse things. And you wonder, Hashem said, speak to the rock. Okay, I can tell you, I can explain why speaking would have been better than hitting. And again, if you look in the, in the commentary about the story, like you wonder, so why didn't Moshe uh, speak to the rock? Why, why did he not follow? So you know what Rashi explains? He did speak to the rock. It was the wrong rock. So what happened when he hit the rock? Oh, when he hit the rock, it was the right rock. That's what Rashi says. It was the wrong rock, and then when it came time to hit the rock, it, it, the, the, the right rock rolled in front of him, and he hit the right rock, and then it, it was only a little trickle, and he hit it twice. So if God wasn't happy with it, so why did he make it work? He should have not have the rock respond until Moshe got it right. So just a few weeks ago, I saw a commentary that blew me away from the Or HaChaim HaKadosh. Anybody hear of the Or HaChaim HaKadosh who lived in Israel in the 1600s? Same time as the Baal Shem Tov. And he was, he was an incredible, incredible scholar and, 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 and holy person. In fact, he's called HaKadosh, the Holy One. And I would strongly recommend, if you really want to have an enriching insight into the psukim of Torah, get the Orachayim. And, and it's now in English. The art scroll has it in English. And he says something very interesting in Pasha's Bamidbar just a few weeks ago. Moshe Rabbeinu is recounting, he's recounting the spies, the story of the spies. Right? And he, and he says, God got angry, and he said that none of you guys are going to go into the land of Israel, uh, only Kalev and Yahushua. And then he says something astounding. He says, Gambi, he sanaf Hashem biglalchem. Also, me did God get angry at because of you. And you, you, it, it really doesn't make any sense because that Moshe Rabbeinu had nothing to do with the spies. His whole thing was hitting the rock, which took place 40 years later. So why is he associating his inability to enter into the land of Israel with the story of the spies 40 years before? So the Orachayim says as follows. He says that before the story of the spies, the Jewish people were destined to go into the land of Israel and, and, and right away right? Not have to wander for 40 years. And they were going to go in for good. They would never have been in exile. You know the story, the, the back story, that the, the night of the spies was Tisha B'Av, was the ninth of Av, and that is what set into motion the future destructions of both Batei Mikdashim, the, 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 both temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av. The source, the origin of that was the story of the spies. In fact, the Medrash says, they, it says, Vayifku, the Jewish people cried on that night. So Hashem says, today you're crying for nothing. In a thousand years, you're going to cry for, for good reason. So in other words, the, the fact that the Jewish people's entry into the land of Israel was going to be temporary was, was, was decreed on that night. And everything that Moshe does is eternal. Moshe cannot be associated with anything that is temporary. And the reason why Moshe couldn't go into the land of Israel is because if he would go in, there would never be an exile. And since that was not destined to be, he could not go into the land of Israel. So the reason he's not allowed to go into the land of Israel really has nothing to do with the hitting the rock. That was just, excuse the expression, a setup. In a sense. Doesn't mean that Moshe didn't exercise his freedom of choice. And it doesn't mean we don't learn. Then, then why did Hashem... 
create the circumstance that Moshe should hit the rock and not go in because of that. Just tell him he shouldn't go in. But we learn something from this. And Moshe Rabbeinu in some way sacrifices his, maybe his reputation. <laughs> of course, he didn't sacrifice his reputation. It's still on the highest level. But Moshe, it is said, erred because he got angry. He only got angry a few times in the Torah. But every time he got angry, there was consequences. What a lesson for us. Anger, nothing good ever comes from anger. How justified it might be, there's always mistakes and, and, and impacts, negative impacts from anger. And we learn it from the story of hitting the rock. So maybe Hashem thought it was important to give us that lesson. But the point here is, is that there are, there, there are different realities taking place beneath the surface. And then we come to the story of David, King David, and Bathsheba. Now, if you really want to have a, an exhaustive uh, overview, um, I gave a lecture, I think, last year. It's on YouTube. You can go watch it. And, and, but the last part of it is what I want to share with you. And that is the same Gemara that says that the Jewish people were, were not really um, conditioned to sin. King David would never have sinned with Bathsheba unless circumstances were such that Hashem helped it along, so to speak. And David HaMelech, there's a medrash that says that he senses that he needs to do this. Because could you imagine the incredible lesson that David HaMelech shows by taking responsibility, by owning up, by being accountable, by not denying it and by not making all kinds of excuses. And if the king of the Jewish people could own up to his uh, mistakes, well, how about us? How about us? And so all of these stories where you scratch your head and you try to figure out how these great people could have erred so, there's so many different um, uh, sub-stories going on. And we can't judge, just like we don't want others to judge us. And the, the Zohar explains a very um, oft uh, thought about conflict between determinism, fate, and freedom of choice. If God knows what we are going to do, so how do we have the freedom to do something different than what God knows? And that's a massive question that the Rambam deals with. Ultimately, we won't be able to satisfy that question on, on every level, but this is an insight I'd like you to carry with you and think about. When a person does something inappropriate, chooses to do a sin, that action is, is that person's alone. That person's alone. God is not part of that. That, par that person chose to do something negative. When a person feels remorse, and he starts to feel regret, and he does teshuva, he extracts the energy, the life force that he injected into that act, making it his, he pulls that out. And now the act has no life force. And the only life force of the act is that it was God's will, ultimately. So why did God, if, God, if it was God's will, why? It's all, it's all negative. And the reason is to give the person an opportunity to elevate themselves to an even higher level of connection and relationship than could have, he could have had without stumbling. 
like a marriage, if two people who love each other have a terrible fight, or there might even be some, God forbid, an infidelity, the marriage is threatened, it's in danger. But if these two people could find it within themselves to uh, work their way out of it and work their way through it, their relationship has the potential to become even stronger than it was before the fight. So it's your choice. Is the fight the end? Or is the fight the beginning of a new level of relationship? That's up to the person. That's where the person's freedom of choice comes about. The fact that the fight happens, that was Hashem. Also channeled through their freedom of choice. But it was also God. So we withdraw our energy. Hashem's energy is that which is left. This act now stands stripped of its negativity and it's only now become a force for positivity, for, for growth. Because you're taking this act and as a result of this act, it's serving as an impetus for deeper appreciation, deeper understanding and, and, and amazing growth that comes from that. And so from the beginning of time, God sets up the world where every act, every positive act of goodness is so beautiful, so worthy, so significant, because the opposite exists. And if the op but the opposite is never intended to be actually, that line is never intended to be crossed. But if it does get crossed, it's like the business plan that goes awry that has the potential for even more profit than if you just have a you know, regular business that uh, doesn't excite anybody or doesn't have any upsets. So I'd like to tell you a story. And here you'll have an, an example of the confluence of providence and choice. So um, Rabbi Amnon and his wife are driving along the highway between Deal, New Jersey, and Brooklyn, New York. And Rav Amnon's wife, uh, her mother had just passed a few years before, and she had a uh, tradition that she would go with her father and her siblings to visit her mother's grave every Arab Rosh Hashanah. And this year she was not going to be able to go for some reason. So they're passing the exit off of the Palisades to the, to the cemetery. So the husband says, maybe you want to just quickly go visit your mom since you're not going to be able to visit her before Rosh Hashanah. Okay, fine. They come into the cemetery. The, um, there's nobody there. And um, they go to the, they drive straight up to the grave. She goes to the, um, the cemetery, to the grave. They get out. And, and he gets out and he finishes his prayers. And he spots a hearse driving in a few rows behind him. The, um, the, uh, they get out, a few people get out, and one of them is um, motioning him to come to, come to them. And they, they, they happen to need one for a minion. They, they were nine. And they're burying their, their dad and their uncle, and, and they need him for a minion, so of course. So they say to Kaddish, and they do the thing, they, put, they lower him into the grave, and the family starts to leave. He says, hey, wait a minute, you didn't finish, you have to fill the grave. Oh, we paid the cemetery to come with the bulldozer and they're gonna finish it for us. And he remembers that in yeshiva, he learned in the Gemara that if you have a, a body and the family is not burying it, your obligation is to bury this body. So he goes over to the, you know, the, the worker, he says, it's your lucky day today, just give me a shovel, you can go home. So 90 minutes, he's laboring to fill the grave all by himself. I know that's hard work. I sometimes do it with three or four people. And he's like, he's feeling amazingly good that he's doing a mitzvah, but as he's driving back to Brooklyn, he's like wondering like, who is, is, who is this fella? And, and, and how, you know, he wasn't planning on being at the cemetery and this is really, really strange. And he happened to have written down the name from the little uh, marker that they put in of who this 
person, this deceased person was. So he, he, he was uh, a graduate of the Nair Yisroel Yeshiva in Baltimore. And he calls his, his the director of the school, Rabbi Nurberger, and he's, he's like telling him the story, and he, you know, he just wants to tell it to somebody. Give me some meaning here. And he says, I even have the guy's name. So he says, he tells him the guy's name, and it goes quiet on the phone. He's shocked, but doesn't say anything to him. He says, let me tell you a story. You know, 55 years ago, you were a 13-year-old kid, and you lived in Seattle, Washington, and there was no schools in Seattle, and your father wanted you so badly to come to the yeshiva. So he saved up his pennies, he didn't have a lot of money, and he bought you an airline ticket for $300. And he sent you, without asking us, to Baltimore. And you showed up. You didn't register. No tuition. Nothing. So I called up your dad and I said, what are you thinking? He says, well, I can't afford, but I want my child to study Torah. So how could we turn this kid away? So I needed to raise some money to cover the tuition. And so I'm thinking, who can I ask? So there was this fella who was traditional from, from the Altaheim, and he didn't have any children of his own. And I went to him and he agreed to pay your tuition for four years for your duration in the yeshiva. And without even hesitating, it was a lot of money back in those days. Of course, tuition is always a lot of money in any day. Um, he says, well, who was that person who paid for my tuition? He says, that was the person that you buried, that you covered his grave. That person who was responsible for your being a Rav, for your being who you are, for your knowledge of the law, that if there is a body laying, it needs to be covered for covered Hamas, for the honor of the deceased, that's the person who you buried, who you committed this incredible act of, of chesed. And he never wanted you to know. He never wanted to get any credit. He didn't want anyone to know. So that's why you never knew who it was. So, Hashem, God, somehow brought them together, right? That's God, right? But then there's, there's, choice, there's a choice issue here. He could have not decided not to join the minion. He could have said, I'm too busy. He could have not stayed behind and he could have rationalized that's their business and it's, you know, I, I need to get back to Brooklyn. So his choice, together with God's providence, created a mitzvah. And the same is when the opposite, God forbid, God's providence, God gives you opportunities to fail. That doesn't mean you have to fail. So never think that why should I try doing the right thing if God knows what I'm going to do anyway, so let me just do the wrong thing. Or let me just do what's easy. You don't get that pass. We don't get that pass. Because our part of the deal is to do our very, very best to do the right thing and to make those choices, and to own those choices, and to take responsibility for those choices, and to take the providential aspects of life and turn them into something holy, as opposed to the opposite. Thank you. Click subscribe to see more exclusive content for the most sought after Jewish speakers, teachers, and thinkers.